day everyone! I am Mom Irish Maniego and I'm going to be your subject teacher for the whole school year 2, Introduction to Organization and Management. Welcome to our first day of online class. And to start with, in Chapter 1, it is all about the evolution of the management theories, principles of management, the qualities of a gems, management process, and the roles and responsibility of a manager. At the end of this chapter, you should be able to understand the meaning of management and the evolution of management theories. To appreciate the importance of the application of the gem cycle in the success and growth of a business. And lastly, to be aware of the critical role of a manager and his or her duties and responsibilities. Now, let's proceed to the next slide. Introduction to Organization and Management Focus Points At the end of this lesson, the students should be able to Understand the meaning of management and the evolution of management theories. Appreciate the importance of the application of the GEM cycle for the success and growth of the business. To be aware of the critical role of a manager and his or her duties and responsibilities. Chapter 1. The Job. 1.1 Evolution of Management Theories For centuries, scientists have been following the behavior of workers and managers. The understanding and analysis of this behavior grew into a new field of study, management thought. Management thought is a relatively new discipline. Over the past century, its modern practice has grown out of the influence of social, economic, and political forces. It has also grown from the influence of many researchers and practitioners, such as Frederick Taylor, Elton Mayo, and W. Edwards Deming. By the late 1800s, America had become the manufacturing capital of the world. Mass production techniques enabled companies to turn out more products at a lower cost than ever before. The sky was the limit. Improvement in assembly line technology led to large-scale production of a wide variety of material goods. These technological advancements came about at such an accelerated pace that a certain degree of chaos developed. Most businessmen of the time perceived this chaos in terms of a national productivity problem. Businesses weren't as efficient as they should have been. Three issues formed the basis for the problem. First was the problem of collaboration between people and machines. Many factory workers were afraid that substituting machine power for human power would result in the elimination of jobs. Workers were also physically afraid of large, noisy, dirty, and dangerous factory machines. The second obstacle was a general inexperience in running large-sized factories and organizations that could produce large volumes of products to lower the cost per item. Because owners and employees weren't used to working in large groups, different authority structures were needed. Standard operating procedures had to be developed and implemented. Whatever efficiencies these procedures brought about were offset in part by an overall depersonalization in the workplace. Bigger businesses were just having bigger problems. The more managers began to realize how costly these problems were becoming, the more they searched for solutions. The search for solutions provided the basis for the development of the four major theories or approaches to management. The classical approach, beginning in the late 1800s, the behavioral approach in the early 1900s, the systems approach in the 1930s and 40s, and the contingency approach, a theory that gained prominence in the 1960s. Let's bring Taylor up in the 1890s. 
The classical approach to management emphasizes the manager's role in the formal hierarchy of authority. It focuses on the task, machines, and systems needed to perform the task efficiently. The classical approach has two components, scientific management and administrative management. An effort to blend the study and functions of engineering with those of business economics came to be known as shop management. Shop management gave way to an entirely new discipline known as scientific management. Scientific management emphasizes improving the efficiency of work by the systematic and scientific study of work methods, tools, and performance standards. Frederick Taylor is remembered for his contributions to management thought in the first part of the 20th century. As a result of his experience in the steel mills of Philadelphia, Taylor concluded that the productivity problem of the day was due to lack of management attention to workers. This contradicted the beliefs of most businessmen in the early 1900s, who blamed the productivity problem on the general laziness of workers. Taylor's theory was based mainly on his observations of soldiering among steel mill workers. Soldiering is the systematic slowdown in work by laborers in order to keep their employers ignorant of how fast the work can be done. Taylor believed that the deceptive practice of soldiering existed for three reasons. First, management didn't know how much work could be done. Second, many laborers thought if they worked too fast, they would work themselves out of a job. And third, workers didn't know how to do their jobs efficiently to begin with. Taylor blamed these problems on poor management. According to Taylor, the role of management is to, one, develop the one best way to perform any task. Two, scientifically select, train, teach, and develop each worker. Three, cooperate with workers and provide an incentive to ensure that the work is done according to the one best way. And four, divide the work and the responsibility equally between management and labor. The other arm of the classical approach to management theory is administrative management. This approach emphasizes that management, as a function, can be applied to any size or kind of organization. Administrative management theories focus on the coordination of the workings of an entire organization, not just organizing the work of individual workers. Classical management theories are broadly grounded in the assumption that work is a rational undertaking that is done in order to make money, and given that, the behavior of people at work will be fairly predictable and easy to understand. The trouble is, that isn't always true. Work often isn't a rational, logical, or reasonable process, and to many people, work is more than just a means of making money. The need to study and understand human behavior and look at management in this light began to develop in the early 1900s. The behavioral approach is a view of management that stresses understanding the importance of people's needs and attitudes within formal organizations. And what we'll do, we'll bring up the Hawthorne studies, if you would, that, were, uh, that took place here in Chicago on the, uh, in the 30s. Beginning in 1924, a group of researchers from MIT and Harvard, led by Professor Elton Mayo, began conducting experiments at Western Electric's Hawthorne plant in Cicero, Illinois. They didn't know it at the time, but their research would span nine years before they could come to a conclusion. We were trying to find out what circumstances in the workplace had the greatest effect on worker output. We experimented with changes in lighting, number of hours the employees worked, rest periods, incentive pay, and hot lunches. It seemed that none of these factors had any direct link to output. But we found that when being interviewed, the workers lost their shyness and fear. They began to feel valued by their co-workers and supervisors. Our study showed that good social relationships in the workplace is what produces more output. The Hawthorne experiments marked a change in the direction of management theory and practice. The systems approach to management theory views organizations as sets of interrelated parts to be managed as a whole with the purpose of achieving a common goal. As systems, organizations consist of inputs, transformation processes, outputs, and feedback. One of the great management thinkers of this half-century is W. Edwards Deming. Deming has been credited with, among other things, resurrecting Japan's economy in the years that followed the Second World War. Bring up Deming. Okay, okay. 
He devoted much of his life to spreading his message of continuous improvement and statistical process control to improve quality. Deming thought it was necessary to integrate the theories that came earlier into an approach in which all dimensions of the organization and its environment are considered as part of one system. About three and a half years ago, Gordon read an article in Harvard Business Review on uh, Dr. Deming and his 14 points, and he showed it to myself and Dick Bentley. Uh, we met with some people, and we attended the Deming four-day seminar and began to get a picture of what this possibility could mean for the company. Some of Deming's theories enabled Marshall Industries, a California electronics company, to make a commitment to total quality within their organization. We see the business as very dependent. Um, each system in our company is dependent on the next system, both our suppliers, our customers, and our internal uh, customer relationships have a tremendous dependency on one another. This requires everybody to work together like an orchestra or a football team where each person has a job to do but no one job is more important than the other. During the 1960s the phrase it depends began to appear regularly in management writing. It depends characterized the contingency approach. The contingency approach emphasizes identifying the key variables in each situation understanding the relationships among the variables, and recognizing the causes and effects of managerial decisions. Generally, the contingency approach is considered to be an outgrowth of the systems approach. From the classical approach to the contingency approach, and from Frederick Taylor to W. Edward Stemming, management thinking has evolved and improved. As ideas change and new theories are developed, future generations will benefit from continued efforts to improve the quality of work and the quality of life in the workplace. This is the beginning of the Things You Need to Know About .com management series. Let's get started with what is it. Management takes place within an organization or structure. Note that at the very top of the structure is management, under which everything falls. Also note that leadership is the foundation of the structure. The upward pointing arrows indicate that it permeates throughout the organization. Now, within the organization or structure, the manager allocates resources, human, financial, physical, and informational, using the functions of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. An example of planning might be creating a budget, which would then become a major control mechanism. Organizing could be the structuring of human resources into an organization chart. Leading might be influencing others to achieve organizational goals created in the planning function. And an example of controlling would be comparing budget with actual figures and taking corrective action if necessary. Please note how the interlocking circles are drawn around each function showing the interrelationships and the dependencies upon each other. Now, performing these functions most efficiently and effectively creates a competitive advantage, which leads to achieving organizational goals. So in summary, management takes place within an organization or structure and is positioned at the top under which everything falls, whereas leadership is the foundation upon which an organization is built. Then, within the organization or structure, managers allocate resources, human, financial, physical, and informational, using the functions of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling to most efficiently and effectively achieve organizational goals.
Management. The simplest definition of management is getting things done through people. It implies that an organization, whether small, medium, or large, is composed of people. A business organization exists for a purpose. A small carinderia, for example, cooks and sells food to customers. A medium-sized transportation company like Victory Liner provides safe transportation to the public to some parts of Luzon. A large-sized manufacturing company like San Miguel processes drinks and food products for sale to the public. All these business entities exist for a profit and have people. It is the people in these organizations that get the work done. To ensure that their assigned tasks are done properly and efficiently, these people have to be managed. The person managing them could be the owner-proprietor of the Carinderia, the manager or supervisor of Victory Liner or San Miguel Corporation. Management is a function that directs and coordinates the efforts to the people to accomplish goals and objectives by using available resources efficiently and effectively. It is also a process of accomplishing the organization's goals by working with and through people. Its task includes planning, organizing, staffing, leading or directing, and controlling. The Industrial Revolution in light of business concern was to improve employees' productivity and efficiency triggered in the development of management theories. Beginning in the late 19th century after the Industrial Revolution but saw more definitive form in the 20th century. Industrial Revolution refers to the transition from hand production methods to the use of different machines, new chemical manufacturing processes, iron production processes, increasing use of steam power, and the development of machine tools. Nineteen tens to nineteen forties, management is science. Management as science was developed in the early 20th century and focused on increasing productivity and efficiency through standardization, division of labor, centralization and hierarchy. A very top-down, management with strict control over people and processes dominated across industries. nineteen fifties to nineteen sixties functional organizations due to growing and more complex organizations the nineteen fifty and nineteen sixties saw the emergence of functional organizations and the human resource hr movement managers began to understand the human factor in production and productivity and tools such as goal setting performance reviews and job descriptions were born We all know managers are the boss, but what do managers actually do? Managers are responsible for performing four main functions, planning, organizing, controlling, and leading. The task of planning involves setting performance objectives and deciding how to achieve them. This starts with identifying a goal and establishing an action plan to reach success. A good manager performs the leading function of management by inspiring their workforce to achieve high performance. The act of controlling is done by measuring performance, then taking action if the desired results were not achieved, or rewarding if the results were achieved. Organizing is arranging tasks, people, and other resources effectively to accomplish work such as our manager here assigning two employees to work together on a project.
function of organization can be broken down further into four steps. Identification of activities, departmentally organizing the activities, classifying the authority, and coordination between authority and responsibility. The task of identifying activities is self-explanatory as a manager must decide which jobs need to be done. Similar tasks are grouped into departments or units in step two of organization. Neglecting to departmentally organize tasks can lead to decreased efficiency due to duplication of effort. Step three of organizing is classifying the authority. This happens when a hierarchy is established within a department. A hierarchy is a clear outline of the chain of command. It allows all employees to understand who they are reporting to and all managers to understand who they are responsible for. Failing to complete step three of organizing and therefore not establishing a hierarchy can lead to confused employees and decreased efficiency. The fourth and final step of organizing is the coordination between authority and responsibility. This happens when an organizational structure is drawn out and understood by all employees, including who reports to who and what jobs need to be done by what departments. So why is organizing so important? Well, the best way to answer that is to look at the difference between a manager who does use his organizational skills and one who doesn't, and the outcomes of both. A manager who organizes effectively has a workforce who are all on the same page and can contribute to a common goal as efficiently as possible. They know who they report to and what their tasks are. There's no confusion, and all the work gets done in a timely manner. If a manager does not organize effectively, this can lead to the employees all being on different pages. This causes confused and frustrated staff, which also leads to decreased productivity and a negative mood in the workplace. It is clear that organizing is an essential part of being a manager. Organization allows a group to be on the same page and increase their productivity to their maximum potential. <laughs> nineteen eighties competitive advantage as the business environment grew increasingly competitive and connected and with a blooming management consultancy industry competitive advantage became a priority for organizations in the nineteen eighties tools like total quality management tqm six sigma and lean management were used to measure processes and improve productivity Employees were more involved by collecting data, but decisions were still made at the top, and goals were used to manage people and maintain control.
using Powtoon. Nineteen nineties process optimization. Benchmarking and business process re-engineering became popular in the 1990s, and by the middle of the decade, 60% of Fortune 500 companies claimed to have plans for or have already initiated such projects. TQM, Six Sigma, and Lean remained popular and a more holistic, organization-wide approach and strategy implementation took the stage with tools such as strategy maps and balance scorecards. What happens when a firm's output is being produced at varying levels of quality? Profit is not being maximized, as depending on the quality grade, the vendor may have to sell at a lower price, or not sell the product at all. The quality of the output is not consistently at the highest level. Process optimization is a technique in which a firm's process parameters such as their sensor values from a production line, are collected and analyzed to change the process in a way that maximizes the outcome of a given criteria. For the optimization of product quality, a predictive function of the quality is optimized. How does it work? The PWC solution consists of two steps. A data mining model, for example a support vector machine or neural network, is trained using historical values of sensor parameters and quality outcomes that have been recorded in the past. By extrapolating the sensor values, the model may find better values than have ever been historically present. Then, a genetic algorithm is used to find the input values with the highest output value or quality. This is done by an intelligent recombination and mutation of sets of process parameters, continuing until the desired quality or a maximum number of iterations or generations is reached. Using the best set of input values, the firm can now fine-tune the production line stations in the production process. With the production line stations now configured from the optimal parameter values, taken from the genetic algorithm, the proportion of high quality products will now begin to increase, resulting in improved profits for the firm. By process optimization, PwC can take your production lines data and use it to ensure the products are at the highest level of quality possible. s big data focused on using technology for growth and value creation big data is broad term for data sets so large or complex that traditional data processing applications are inadequate accuracy in big data may lead to more confident decision making and better decisions can mean greater operational efficiency cost reductions and reduced risk Retailers, data is both their biggest asset and biggest challenge. It's the key to understanding and engaging their consumers. It lets them efficiently and effectively plan their product assortment mix at the hyper-local level. At the store level, data is at the core of effective store optimization. And when it comes to supply chain management, data means visibility and flexibility at a global level. Retailers competing on low margins have known for decades that data is a powerful tool, and big data takes it and supercharges it for the modern multi-channel retail environment. Retailers who embrace big data throughout their organization can unlock hidden value in many other functions as well. For instance, risk management presents a huge opportunity for retailers to use their existing data to improve the bottom line. What can big data tell us about customers? 
Today's consumers know more about you than ever before, and you know more about them. Without the insights that big data analytics provide, you risk missing opportunities to engage them with the kinds of products and offers they're searching for, or maybe didn't even know they wanted. Big data lets retailers target consumers with personalized suggestions, upsell and cross-sell based on prior behavior and predictive models. This can include acquisition pattern analysis, collaborative filtering based on associations between products, customer-specific scorecards, real-time store sales modeling, and can even determine optimal pricing for individual consumers. That ability to predict what consumers will purchase and for how much is incredibly useful. Reliable software solutions for the retail industry give companies the ability to compare a customer's history to others like them so they can make more accurate predictions and suggestions. What does all this mean for retailers in the real world? For retailers, big data means intelligently measuring, monitoring, and modeling their business in real time. This creates the ability to act on what shoppers are telling them, efficiently improving customer acquisition and conversion for lower costs and increased revenues. In addition to what data tells retailers about customers, a real-time insights into the entire business creates flexibility during periods of supply volatility or market uncertainty. This makes retail supply chains more efficient and effective, controlling costs and enabling effective supplier coordination. If you'd like to start taking full advantage of the power of data in your retail business, reliable software can help. We work closely with each of our customers in the retail industry to create unique, innovative data strategies, solutions, and visualizations to help your business users quickly and easily capture and implement the insights they need to continually improve your business. Contact us today to learn more by calling 248-234-4011 or feel free to email us anytime at sales at rsrit.com. Three Eras of Management Theory Development Classical Management Theory, 1880s to 1920s Neoclassical Management Theory, 1920s to 1950s Modern Management Theory, 1960 up to present Classical Management Theories, 1880s to 1920s Three Classical School of Management Scientific Management, Administrative Management, Bureaucratic Management Scientific Management, by Frederick Winslow Taylor, there was shortage of worker. Solution raising the efficiency of workers to increase productivity. Focused on organizational structure. Administrative Management, by Henry Fail, focused on the part of management that are most neglected. Give rise to Fail's five function of management planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating and controlling. Bureaucratic Management, by Max Weber, organization should be managed impersonally. Organization should have formal organizational structure where specific rules were followed, based on clearly defined hierarchical level and rules. Neoclassical management theories, with a more human-oriented approach, focused on answering questions related to the best way to motivate structure and support employees within the organization. The two main sources of neoclassical management theories, human relations movement and behavioral movement. Human relations movement, designed to increase workers' productivity. If the organization is so concerned to the employee the satisfaction level would increase leading to the increase of productivity.
Behavioral movement. Emphasize the importance of attempting to understand the various factors that affect human behavior within an organization. It involves the study of attitudes, behavior of individuals and groups in an organization. Modern management theory. Characterized by equal emphasis on man and machine. Three approach to modern management theory. Quantitative or mathematical approach. Systems approach. Contingency or situational approach. Quantitative or mathematical approach. Treats an organization as a system. A system is any set of distinct parts that interact to form a complex whole. An organization is also a system with parts such as employees, assets, products, resources, and information that form a complex system. All of these parts are brought together to achieve the objectives. System approach. It emphasized the use of statistical models and systematic mathematical techniques to solve complex Wait, management please. problems. Further studied in three areas. Management science or operation research. Operations management. And management information systems. Contingency or situational approach argues that there is no one universally applicable approach in which to manage an organization. Management problems are different under different situation and required to be tackled with expertise specifically for the situation. And for the summary. The simplest definition of management is getting things done through people. It implies that an organization, whether small, medium, or large, is composed of people. Management as science was developed in the early 20th century and focused on increasing productivity and efficiency through standardization, division of labor, centralization and hierarchy. The three eras of management theory development are Classical management, neoclassical management and modern management theory. 